we got involved in the event of Rising through um, Jeremy Bolt, wasn't it? Yeah, Jeremy yeah. Bolt. Jeremy and Paul, Paul, Paul Anderson. Anderson. Uh, we did, Paul Anderson had used uh, a couple of our already written tracks. Um, Halcyon, wasn't he? he yeah, used he used that in uh, shopping. But we, we the oh, first time we met them was because they asked us to do a track for shopping, shopping yeah. which we did. But then he used Halcyon in that, and then he used it in Mortal Kombat as well. Yeah, I think that's it was. Right. And um, did he? No, oh, no, that, yeah, that's it. Yeah, but he sort of he, he kept using bits of our stuff um, prior to Event Horizon, and just got us involved in that because he just. I don't know, I, I, you know, who knows what someone's motives are, but he just said, oh, I'd like you to sort of work on this with Michael Kamen a bit, to just give it that sort of, give it a different edge, do you know what I mean? I suppose it's that sort of electronic sort of element, you know, you know, back to the science fiction and synthesizers sort of vibe, get a bit of that going on there. I think he loves, happened, it. Th- yeah. he loves it all, doesn't he? He yeah. loves all the sort of rave music and the... And oh, the yeah, yeah, he does. And yeah. He really does, and so I think yeah, that's what he was... That's the angle he was going on, isn't it? Yeah, just he just wanted to, to throw involved. a bit more of that in there, you know. Um, they obviously had never done a score for a movie before, so the studio felt very uncomfortable with giving, you know, a group like that the score of a, a major film. So what we did was we married them with Michael Kamen, who was a much more established composer, uh, to try and get what I thought was a very successful and, and unusual mix of kind of modern sounds with the more kind of classical score that Kamen provided. And they worked together very well. I mean, they did, it's not like they did their stuff separately. They would go and have joint recording sessions, Cayman and Orbital. Our, our sort of main involvement with him, the, the main, the, the sort of big thing that we did was um, he got, he basically got like a 30 piece orchestra in his, he had like this big old um, building that he bought. Theatre, it was an old theatre. And he yeah. said, he said, okay, right, let's have a jam with an orchestra. And we were like, what? You know, what do you do? You know, it's madness. And um, he just got this sort of 30 piece orchestra in, and we went down there and he said, OK, you know, I've written a few things, got a few things printed up for him. He said, you know, they, they get a bit funny if you don't give them some music to play on, but we'll just, we'll just mess with them and jam with them. And then basically, we set up, you know, he set up like a, an eight track recorder to record them, and we sort of walked around with our DAP machine. And basically, he just started jamming with them, didn't he? Saying, OK, science fiction horror. Okay, baby bear. I got him. I got him. Stand by, people. Stand by. And then, basically, we start messing with them. And, you know, like like someone sort of, I don't know, just playing around with a, a band of three or four people in their bedroom, do you know what I mean? And um, just sort of worked up all this sort of crazy stuff and just, just really sort of, I don't know, sort of pushing the sounds of these people, like getting the sort of bass... Um, clarinet and just recording the sort of stoppers without any you know sound going through it things like that and basically we you know after an afternoon of this we took it all away and sampled it all up and just went mad with all of that didn't we yeah. and that's that you know the sort of tracks that we came up with and the parts that we did were sort of based on Michael Kamen's jammings with with these you know musicians in his big hall and we sort of turned it into sort of more rhythm based you know sort of chugging things, you know, like the, op- the opening credits, for example, you know. We were b- big fans of their music, uh, particularly this sort of muscular techno beat that they brought to it. And we had this orchestral, rather whimsical score, rather haunting score from Michael Kamen, and we wanted to bring in a bit of anger, a bit of edge. And so uh, there's that wonderful piece, um, again, when you're on the central corridor of... Um, of the ship towards the end when Fishburne is trying to get away and and so you have the haunting melodies from Michael Kamen and then you have this hard rhythmic pounding from Orbital and uh, that's what we wanted them from them to, to bring to give a little sort of modern edge to what he'd done. Look, I think preparing for a film sit down and watch loads of films like it <laughs> <laughs> and um, no but you know you do tend to do that though don't yeah, you, you actually do. you know, I, I, I like to see yeah I like to yeah, research. Yeah, research. down the video shop. Oh, down yeah. the video shop. Then we've got a film job. Yeah. You know, but it's sort of. It's quite interesting because you don't. You know, on the one hand, you you know you can sort of see what works and doesn't work, and and also you don't want to do something that sounds just like another film. Do you know what I mean? So you can see what to avoid as well, can't mm. you? Mm. But. Yeah, I mean, it's it's sort of. We've, ne- we've never really done enough to, to, to settle on a way of working, do you know what I mean? It's always always different, but 
I think that, that you know preparing for it mainly is just getting all your bits together, getting all the film on your computer, and just then sitting down. It's sort of almost like being the the pianist in the old-fashioned cinema. You just sit down and start playing things while watching it and see what sticks. You know. Gateway opening in T minus five minutes. We recorded sort of various bits, um, the, you know, knowing full well it wouldn't all be used, but the, the, because we were going away to Lollapalooza, we did sort of two versions, sort of two to four versions of the, of the opening credits, uh, again, of which sort of we le you know, left it in the hands of Michael Kamen to, to mess with, and, you know, he used sort of bits and edited other bits with it, and, you know, do you know what I mean, uh, from what we'd done um, to make it fit the credits. Um, and that all worked out fine. That was good, you know. So like a bit of a kit form to to work from. And we did like a sort of faster version of a of a tune we'd done. You know, we basically did sort of quite long sections of music that had various bits, so that it's almost like giving someone sort of musical Lego to to play with, you know, and chop around. Um, but most of it appeared on the sort of soundtrack album. Um, you know, was was sort of. Um, fitted into that but not into the film but you know but it is it's all it, it was it was sort of like two or three sort of main things that we did um of which it sort of appear in the two section the two main sections of the film that they do appear in you know like the opening credits and the bit where they're sort of deciding to get out I think the idea of the event horizon is very cool. You know, in terms of, of science, the idea of going through a black hole. One of the scenes that Paul and I are very proud of is the scene in which Sam Neill, Sam Neill explains what a black hole is and what an event horizon is and how you can just... He takes the piece of paper and <laughs> he puts the, the pen through it. It's just great, because it's really... It was, we were worried about how we explain that. But I think that's appealing to people. I think the mystery of event horizons and black holes, the unknown, I did feel I, I was constantly dropping black hole references into conversation for a short while afterwards, as if I was some expert on the space-time continuum. But I couldn't really do it without folding up a centerfold and sticking a pencil through. A lot of people are very fond of Event Horizon, and, and a lot of people say, oh, yeah, you designed that Ah, You know, it's very, like, it's... Um, you know, I think a film we're all very proud of, and it's... I think... It's not quite like any other film I've seen. It gives you a real sense of place. I mean, I felt it when we were shooting it, even, that these were very real places. And uh, I thought the design was magnificent. And not only the designer was responsible, but Paul was very hands-on with it all. And uh, as scary as it is, you know, and, and however well Paul works his craft, and he does, he makes you jump and he makes you, you know, great laughs for release of tension and all that stuff. There's more than that. There's something thematically I think that really grabs your attention about being taken to your own personal hell and back you know the ship takes everyone to their own personal hells and uh, it feels like a real team of people stuck in an unpleasant environment you know much like Alien did when they wake up you really feel like these guys have been on a bunch of salvage missions together and then something goes a bit wrong and a lot of films where a bunch of uh, you know there's a team of people in peril it feel contrived solely to, for our entertainment. Not with this one. But this one, it feels like it's just there, you know, they're a working team. It could, it's only a few years from now. It's the kind of people and the kind of situation that could happen. Maybe the circumstances get a little bit extraordinary. I think Event Horizon has a very strange quality about it, which is on the surface, it's a, a fairly straightforward uh, genre piece, um, science fiction, haunted house kind of film. But I think below that, there uh, are some very adult themes about the way the characters deal with their past and the, the things that really scare them. And I think that for a lot of the audience, that touched a very deep nerve. It's, it's you know, it's an unusual film, and it, has a, it does have a quality, I think, that is just, just a, a little bit edgy, a little bit different, and, and visceral, I think. It's, you know, exciting. And I... I think the film deals with a lot of dark subject matter and it has a real kind of religious, obvious religious um, undercurrent to it. And I think those kind of things don't date. 
Um, you know, the idea was, although it was set on a spaceship, what we were making essentially was a haunted house movie and a movie about hell. And um, I, I think in that way it wasn't science fiction um, and it was, it was dealing with darker, deeper issues. And I think those issues are still as relevant now as they were then. I think the film is frightening. I think the film makes you feel anxious. I think that people being tortured by sins, by their guilt, is a very universal feeling. I think that the, the guilt in the film the mother who's deserted her child, the husband who's deserted his wife, the, the commander who let a man die. These are all very universal feelings of guilt. So I think there is something low, quite appealing on quite a mass level in, the, in that way. They're not so specific that you can't really connect with it. I think the film is still popular because it touches on the base roots of fear that's in everybody's head and that is where you travel out beyond what you know and into a world you don't know and I think there's a lot of psychological imagery in there which is still gets under people's skin it's still a scary movie it's the haunted emptiness of the ship it's the brilliant performances of the actors and hopefully it's some of the effects as well that grab you and take you in and take you to another place, a very scary, lonely, empty place, but still a great place to go. And you look at movies like The Haunting and, and like The Shining, and I'm not saying we're anywhere near as good as those movies, but those movies tended to not be big films when they were released, but kind of gain a cult audience over time, because they're films that you talk about. You talk about the ending of The Shining, you talk about the ending of The Haunting. If it's all tied up in a nice, neat bow, you know, there's nothing to talk about. You know, that was a great movie experience, but I don't really need to discuss it. And I, I think event benefits from that. I, I think the things that hurt us originally are the things that help sustain us now and, and mean that we still have an audience.